This is a complete sidebar, but this is like a massive, that's huge, huge tomato. Anyways, today's video, we're going to talk about two soil amendments that have a very promising future in the world of science. I have this thing called a degree in soil science. Not that it means anything at all. Uh, it does not mean you should listen to me and only me. I can promise you that. What I can say is that I read a lot on weird stuff such as these two products. And I'm intrigued at some stuff I've seen recently coming out of the world of science when it comes to these products specifically. Now, the reason why I picked these two and why I didn't pick a number of other ones that do exist is because these ones have low barrier to entry. They are found in mass. You could make them or forage for them if you're in the right location. And the price of them should be relatively low, if not free. Meaning the barrier to entry on this from an agricultural to just a home gardener perspective is pretty darn low. Okay, so number one is actually kelp. So if you don't know what kelp is, it's literally seaweed from the ocean and it is in mass everywhere in the ocean. It is obviously organic because it's not farmed with chemicals yet. I'm sure that'll change eventually if this becomes a big product to use in this space. Now you're probably wondering what makes kelp so interesting in the world of soil enhancement. So when these were applied, specifically in a liquid form, not as like a powdered product form, as a liquid form, we tended to see pretty big changes in the soil health. It affected shoot growth, germination rates, the nutrient usage, meaning the bioavailability of nutrients, the actual soil physical structure of the entire structure in and of itself, increases in soil microbes, a better kind of reaction of the plant to both abiotic and biotic stressors, and just overall increased crop yields. Now this is on a large agricultural scale that a lot of this stuff was done on, but the kind of main benefit that we saw this in quite often was actually a sandier soil or a soil that hasn't recently been kind of planted in or cultivated in some way. Because a lot of the benefits seem to point toward the fact that it's increasing organic material in these soil systems. I would hazard a pretty big guess, even though nothing I read used potting soil, but I would hazard a guess that potting soil would have either no effect with the kelp being added or less of an effect with the kelp being added. So keep that in mind if you're gonna use this with like a container or with indoor plants, for example. Now, the levels or the amount that was put in, and this is the part that I find probably the most interesting, was actually pretty low. They put this all in through drip irrigation, and quite a few of them have now replicated putting it in through drip irrigation. And because of this, we we're able to limit the exposure of excess nitrogen or a whole bunch of decomposition having to take place. Now, where you could put a big butt on this is the fact that it is just simply adding organic material to a soil system and this could be replicated in many cases by different forms of liquid organic material being added to your soil. So what that means is that you would need to and I would want to see some sort of comparative of kelp versus other not water soluble but water homogenized products before it's being applied to the soil. Now the way that they liquefy this does not it's not soluble in the water. It's just kind of in suspension of the water. And that makes it difficult to put out on a mass scale because obviously you would have to add some sort of chemical in there to help it keep suspended. And if you put it in a bottle and the person didn't shake it properly, it probably won't work out very well. It can't be applied via powder because then it's not going to make it into the soil system where it needs to go. So there's obviously some packaging and logistic details that also need to be worked out. Probably the biggest turnoff and definitely there's got to be a way in which we can kind of navigate this or change the result of this and that is the fact that it's really high in arsenic. The arsenic issue, I did do a quick search on dietary kelp because I know kelp is a food as well. Turns out in the world of food safe kelp, not fertilizer kelp, those are two very different things, FYI. Um, 
they have found a way to lower the arsenic. It's still present, but it's below the allowable limit for human consumption. So that means they have a way of finding and or processing this out. So that does give some hope to the, the arsenic argument. But keep in mind, kelp fertilizers are not regulated. So there is a possibility there's arsenic in them. Just FYI. And arsenic, as you know, is toxic to humans and it can be toxic to plants. Unfortunately, plants can uptake arsenic. Uh, they may not be hugely bioavailable to a plant, meaning it can't take it up you know, exponentially, but it, they definitely can take up arsenic. Some plants even have arsenic in them. So yeah, that's unfortunate. Now, I think with science, they'll be able to eliminate or remove or somehow filter or titrate out this arsenic in the future. In the meantime, I would say you're gonna have to look at and or consider arsenic in these products because I know there's a lot of kelp products out there on the market. So if you're gonna go this route, I would do your research to figure out what brands have arsenic and which ones don't have arsenic. I will try to look up some and find out if I can find any data in regards to how to tell if a kelp product has arsenic. And I like it because it doesn't feel gimmicky. It doesn't feel like they're taking your money and running like some other products out there, soil enhancing products, if you will. But it also is being studied. So it's being looked at outside of just the hobbyist gardening world where we predominantly see it right now. Interested, not convinced, not convinced. I'm just, I'm, I'm watching this all play out, if you will. Okay, so next product out there is actually biochar. So you guys have asked for various different photo or photos, videos on this. And essentially biochar is like, it's charcoal that has been charged, if you will. Now, we know that it's valuable because we've seen it in ancient agricultural practices, like mm -hmm the forests in South America, and it's turned soil that's infertile, fertile. Now, this is being looked at more and more. And this is really odd, but I actually was speaking to someone who works with SunGrow, and she's a media scientist. And media scientist, not as in like media, but as in products that go into potting soils. And they're looking at a lot of different products out there that they commonly hear the gardening space talk about. So. If you ever need to know, Geek Crew, if the big dogs are watching you, they are. They're on the forums, they'll listen to what you guys are saying, what you're using, and then trying to figure out if there's a basis for it. Anyways, she's been looking at the utilization of biochar in potting soils. Does it have a benefit? Does it have a certain dosage that matters? Does the place it came from matter? The issue that she did admit to having is that the consistency will change. Meaning if they're to buy a batch and that batch works out well, and they can't necessarily just rebuy that batch because temperature, the original product in and of itself and how it's then charged and what it's charged with can all cause variability in how potent or not potent or how useful that product may be. With all that being said, it's look, being looked at on agricultural scales as well, not just the world of sun grow soil, if you will. So what we're looking at and why we're looking at this, the important thing here is not what we're looking at in biochar, it's more so why we're looking at biochar. So biochar is very unique in the sense that it mimics soil very closely. The reason why it mimics soil so closely is because of its surface area. So two things that come out of biochar mimicking a soil surface area is that a single piece of biochar has a lot of surface area and it's been estimated at times to be 9,000 square feet in just an eraser sized piece, which sounds crazy, but it is because there's lots of tunneling and fissures and all that sort of stuff. What you see on the outside is not what's in the inside. And when we have this, we have a lot of very unique features. These features can include things like higher cation exchange capacity, which is just a really fancy word for the battery of our soil and its ability to hold on to nutrients and its ability to actually and hold on to water. So in a world, if there's a drought, such as what we're experiencing here in Canada, and we wanted to remedy that naturally, 
Unfortunately, one way to do that, science is leaning into the fact that biochar could be a remedy to a world that is getting very dry very quick. The electrical charge means it can and will hold on to nutrients. Now, this is where the way that this biochar was charged and how it was treated prior to you putting it in your garden is very important. If you have charcoal that has not been charged, meaning it hasn't been exposed and allowed to soak up nutrients to offset its electrical charge, you can and will, absolutely will, run into problems. And these problems uh, will show up in the form of micronutrient deficiencies and some pretty darn sick looking plants. Now, this obviously is less than ideal. So we need to avoid that and we need to be careful when choosing products. And we definitely want to follow the instructions when they give you dosage because it can turn sideways very, very quickly for you. So that part kind of sucks. What is cool though, is that because of its ability to hold onto water and its electrical charge, it's actually really good at holding onto nutrients in an environment where you have high levels of volatilization and or leaching. So volatilization is the gassing off of nutrients into the atmosphere and leaching is actually the removal of nutrients from the soil system via water and gravity, if you will. So if you have biochar in your system, it's more likely to hold on to any fertilizer, organic or synthetic, that you may add longer term for your plants to access it later on. Now the application where this would make the most sense would be in sandier soils and not so much in a clay soil, although you could add it into a clay soil and as it decompose, it will increase macro porosity, which is few and far between in a clay soil, which has more oxygen and more oxygen means more. Anyways, it just goes all downhill. And if you wanna learn more about how to fix a compacted soil or to even figure out if you have a compacted soil and if you need to do anything, you wanna check out this video here. And that video right there is actually what Google says to watch. So maybe listen to them first. Like I said, you don't wanna to listen to me solely. Anyway, 